welcome to In My Garden. I'm Hari Bersens, and today we're in Frank Gropen's garden. And thanks so much for having us out, Frank. You're welcome. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing to see what Frank has done here over the last 20 years. And so um, I thought we'd just ask you to take us through the garden, show us what you got here. And as we walk along, I'll, I'll ask some questions. But this season, it's, it's tomato season. Um, course among lots of other things but we're pretty active with the tomatoes now so Frank's got a lot to share with us about tomatoes so we'll we'll end in the tomato patch and uh, learn more about that there so yeah I was just noticing Frank that you've got um, comfrey and uh, I've got comfrey all over the place at my house but it's huge it's like you know really tall and um, before we started filming Frank was telling me he actually cuts this back and uses it so I've already, I haven't even gotten one step into the garden and I've already got something that I could do. So tell me how, you know, why is it here and what, what you're doing with it? Well, wastewater from my cabin comes out here and the comfrey serves to soak up any nutrients that might be in the water. And then when I cut the comfrey and use it as a mulch on the tomatoes, say, then it uh, it's a nutritive mulch and it gets recycled back to the garden. So uh, you're cutting it like... It's been cut twice this year. And where are you cutting it? Like, down at the base. So right off, right here? Uh, yeah, you can use a machete or a scythe and just lop it off at the ground and it comes right back. This, Like I said, this has been cut twice. And I probably will leave it for the rest of the season. It can go into the compost pile too. It just melts. Fast. It's a high nitrogen potash fertilizer. So you just take the leaves, let them kind of wilt for a little bit, and then just layer them up around the bottom of the tomatoes? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And cover them with grass clippings. And in two weeks, they're gone, disappeared. Uh -huh. And all the little tomato rootlets are in there feeding. Get, getting more right. food. And it's something that keeps growing back, so you're producing, you're basically growing your own... Fertilizer. fertilizer. Yep. yep. Well, I am too, but I'm not using it. <laughs> okay. Well, the ra rabbits like it too, I guess. Yeah. Uh, there's blueberries here uh, that have been there a while. They're uh, kind of ragged this year. They didn't pollinate well, but uh, some years there's a lot more. Of course, I didn't prune them properly, I don't think, but I'm learning. So... That's what I've, I say a lot in the show is that we're all learning and no matter how long you've been gardening, I, I feel like I'm a beginner. Well, and I've only learned from my own mistakes, yeah. you know, and experience. Uh, I keep a garden book, which is real important. I think people should do that, just a simple spiral notebook. And anytime I do something in the garden, if I remember, I write it down with the date and uh, one notebook can hold years and years of uh, dates and notes, notes about nature, how the spring is progressing because uh, it enables you to key your springtime garden activities to the, what's happening rather mm -hmm. than by the number on the calendar because each year is different and it's a tremendous help in, uh, to remind you what to do when. As, uh, starting early and when you first sow seeds all the way to when you harvest. So yeah. that's real help, been real helpful to mm -hmm. me. Yeah, I, I've been keeping one for the first time this year. Yeah, write things down. It's really fun to, and then also to see how, oh, I, I thought that I planted that three weeks ago, but it was actually two weeks ago. Or, yeah, and then yeah. you can go back if you think it was too, you planted something too early, a, a late crop for the fall or whatever, you can make notes, you know, you can highlight it, whatever. And then when you come back and refer to it, you, it refreshes your memory. It's like, oh yeah, I think I'll wait another week. Mm -hmm. That was too early. Yeah, yeah. So that's worked for me. Mm -hmm. But there's watermelon here, sugar baby watermelon. And then... Uh, and there's some, right, there's a one we can see here. They're, one right they're there. real green There's compared one. to the ones I'm, I'm, you see at the store. Yeah. yeah. And those are two rows of peanuts there. And the peanut 
actually is the root. Is that right? Is that a well, they a form. They form in the ground. They're not really the root. Oh, okay. See these little uh, prongs here on the peanuts. Where are they? See these little things here? Oh yeah. Those little things. They go down into the ground, and they uh, the peanuts form at the tip of that thing. They grow into the ground. And they're a late, long season crop. They won't be done until like October. And these are some pole beans called uh, turkey craw. That's an old variety. And, and you've uh, got them climbing up. Yeah, a this. Deer fence I didn't or? put this. Uh, I didn't put this post in very well, so they sagged. But they're all. You can see they're just. What is this? It's climbing on. What is this called? This is a mesh. Uh huh. My friend Tom gave me this. It's mesh that's used for trellising. Oh, okay. And uh, I normally would just put twine mm -hmm. between the posts as they grow, thin twine, mm -hmm. like round bale uh, twine. But uh, I tried, this is my first year with this stuff. I'm wondering how I'm going to get the vines off of it to reuse it. Right. I think they'll get brittle and dry, but yeah. I'll find it. I'll find out. Give you something to do on a winter day. Yeah, these are some <laughs> peonies that have been in the way for a long time. Okay. These uh, these are apples in the backyard. I grafted these trees. This is a a giant Japanese green is the variety and uh, once again they didn't pollinate real well this year. There's, some of these trees are bare, but some are nice. Do you think that late freeze got them? It was weird. You know, every year is a challenge. Yeah. But uh, this was a, a row of bed of onions, and I got a, I'm in the process of getting them out. I have broccoli, cabbage, and cauliflower that I need to put in and is this is one of the beds that I'll gonna... use. This was early corn and the earliest sowing has been harvested. That's the second down there. Mm -hmm. I sow corn I think this year seven times but these two batches went through the horrendous rain of May. Mm -hmm. 22 inches of rain we had. Yeah that was kind of really crazy. Hard. So yeah. it was yellow for a lot of its life before it started growing, so it's not really, didn't do too well. But uh, I'll put buckwheat in this bed and just let it go. Is that a, for a, uh, like like a, a cover. ground cover? Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. and, and that, I'm not gonna grow anything in this bed. It's uh -huh. a, one of the poorer beds here too. This garden is relatively new as, as I've expanded, added more beds. Uh, it's the rockiest. I gotta do some tree work. It doesn't get enough sun. The kitchen garden, I call it, because closeness to the house. This is oregano here. This here and that are some parsley from last year going to seed. Uh, I'm, I want to save the seed. This is just a bit of basil here. This is more parsley from for this year. What do you... Um with that much parsley, are you going to preserve it or no, how? No, not really, no. So you just I can, use I it dig as up, you need it? In the fall, I'll dig up whole plant, cut them back. If you cut the plant back early, r really harshly, like in September, it gets a more compact growth and then you can dig it up, put it in a pot and give it to someone. And then they can have parsley all winter. Oh, okay. Uh, these are strawberries that are mostly finished although it technically they're an ever-bearing variety i don't know the name but there's a few little ones here and there but we got a ton out of them early and that's the second year they've been in that spot how many years do you leave them uh two or three after mm -hmm. that i'll take a mantis tiller i use two tillers a troy belt and i have a mantis which is one of these little tiny things with real sharp blades and I can till through it and thin it and uh, let it regrow so it doesn't get too overgrown, but I'm not really growing strawberries by the book. 
Yeah. You know, that's, mm -hmm. th th there's a lot of different ways to do it. This is just some mint here, apple mint, I believe it's called, that I got to beat back. And there's a row of uh, peppers there, just past the strawberries. Uh, Looks like you have quite a few on those plants. Yeah, there's, there's, there's some there. Behind them in the shadow is uh, some of that rainbow, different colored Swiss chard, and behind them is uh, our zinnias. And you, I see that you've got flowers throughout the garden. Is that to attract the pollinators? I think it helps. And yeah. of course, just to look at butterflies. And mm -hmm. I sure love seeing them. Yeah. And they're easy, things like zinnias for sure. Yeah, I love zinnias. They're one of my favorite flowers. And they last so long when you cut them and bring them inside. Peanuts. Uh, they're were they not planted doing too... at the same time as the other? Yes, but these are affected by the roots of these trees. Yeah. Uh, as these shade trees have grown, the beds closest to the cabin have become nearly useless from the uh, competition for nutrients and moisture and sun. And uh, the next bed there is are young carrots that are just getting established will need to be thinned, but uh, that bed was early peas. And when the peas come out in the spring, well, late spring, usually down here at this elevation, we're at about 1,500 feet. I would say, uh, I would say about the first or second week of June, the peas are done. You really only pick them for about 10 days. Mm -hmm. And then the heat kind of right that's about it but that's good timing and the soil is good there because uh, I, it's good for uh, putting carrots in for the fall good timing so is that a regular rotation yes wherever it you've is had the I've been peas? putting carrots in following my peas for years and I don't even think about it anymore it's just that's where it goes uh, carrots don't like uh, strong fertilizer or compost or manure or anything like that. And before the peas were tomatoes. Tomatoes got fed heavily. And then after that, the soil got reworked for peas the following year. And then after that, right now is, is carrots. And uh, that kind of soil is pretty good for carrots. These two beds are, uh, uh, the main season corn, and you can see from the different heights that they were sown at different times. These are four more sowings. The first two in the back of the house uh, are nearly done, and the next will be the tallest, of course, and then the stuff in front of it that's just starting to tassel. Then that stuff behind in this upper bed at the end, and then this stuff here. Is and there's sweet one. Corn? There's one last sowing of corn right over there that's actually less about a foot high. And so that corn will be the last. And hopefully I'll be eating corn until the frost. And, and it's all sweet corn? It's all sweet corn. It's three varieties. Uh, it's either Colorado, Ambrosia, or Luscious. And they're all early corns, roughly 67 to... 73 days or so. They don't get too tall, which is good for the thunderstorms and mm -hmm. we have that tends to knock them down. Uh, between these two rows of corn is uh, a row of potatoes that in another couple of weeks I'll dig. They've of course died back. So there's it's some volunteer, there's some volunteer buckwheat that's kind of... Is that what messing. this is? Yes, that's all buckwheat. Okay, that's a cover crop. Yes. And no. I didn't intend to leave it there, but you know, it's, it, it's not hurting not anything. Not hurting anything. And the, and the potatoes are in the ground just because it's fine to leave them there. There's not a reason really besides well, that. Well, they say that potatoes shouldn't be dug until two weeks after the vines appear completely dead. Oh. And I think that's so that there's no risk of transmitting the blight, potato, potential potato blight to the to the next crop. 
I think the spore, the you know, the length of time that the spores operate oh. or are viable rather. And we're walking past the compost, the lower end of my compost bin, which is, you know, fairly tidy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not always. This one's empty on the right. There's a bucket of lime there and uh, not that I use much in the compost. This one is nearly finished. This is one I'm filling right now. But at this time of the year, uh, I put a lot of stuff, you know, into the garden. When I pick corn, the whole plant immediately gets chopped up with that machete into the compost bin. And those are squash plants I'm tearing out for so I can plant the next thing. And are you layering? Um... They do. I, yes. Yes and no. I kind of keep it, the moisture and the contents kind of mixed. Mm -hmm. And so then you'll add some uh, sawdust or? Uh, sometimes. Uh, I do. I have a lot of sawdust here because I live next to the sawmill. Yeah. Which, and it's free. The That's price handy. Is, the yeah. price is right and so is the location. This is all celeriac here that I'm saving for the seed. Oh, you're gonna have a lot of seed Celery there. seed, not to regrow, but for seasoning too. Oh, celery okay. seed is a great seasoning, I think. Uh-huh. Uh, that's yellow squash there in the next bed. So for this, um, collecting that seed for seasoning, what's that process? Uh, I'd like to see it get as mature as possible, at least start to turn brown and hopefully it's not, uh, it's not, there's ripe seed in there, but hopefully when that happens, it's not the time when, uh, when we get all this rain. You can see the leaf here. The celery, celeriac leaf is great in soups. And it's like, you can use it. It tastes like celery, It right? does, it does. Yeah. I don't use the root in celeriac. Mm -hmm. I have, you know, it forms a glob, globe kind of root, but uh, I use it mostly the leaf. Mm-hmm. And uh, let me see, these are eggplants here that are sort of struggling. They're doing okay. So add, but, how do you overcome the uh, flea beetle? Well, it's, it's a challenge, that's for sure. I've never had eggplant get very big because the flea beetles yeah, just Yeah, the key eat it. is to protect them in some way, whatever you want to use as a spray, whether you're organic or not. I am 99%, I wouldn't claim to be a hundred percent, but the critical point is right when you set the set in your starts in the ground until they root in. Once they root in, then they're on their own and they can pretty much defend themselves against, I mean, you'll have losses, but the bugs, you know, give the plant a bit of a head start. Th these are beans here. I call them SIDS beans. They're a dry shelling, uh, a dry bean. Ah. A white bean with a caramel colored eye. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've grown them for several years, so that'll, that's just for dry beans. Do you let this, them grow all the way till they die? And then yeah, well, it depends the on the year. You, you know, a dry bean doesn't do much if it's ripening or curing, if it's sitting on rotten, wet ground, you know. Yeah. So as they, the husks turn papery, once they turn, uh, start to turn brown or dry out, you know, you just pick through and try and keep getting the driest ones. And I put them on screens or spread them out. Uh, beyond, down there at the end of this bed, this is the last corn which will come in before the frost. And corn, I always plant corn in a double row like this, mm -hmm. a double row and uh, zigzag. And that way, when we get these summer thunderstorms that flatten it, when the wind comes through at 60 miles an hour, I can pick it back up into little tripods. Each three forms a little tripod and I can take a piece of twine and tie them together at the top until they reroot. Mm. I can't believe none of this. We haven't had a storm to blow down corn yet. Nope, knock, knock on, on wood. wood. <laughs> yes. So, uh, and I, this is easy to sow. I put in three kernels in each one and thin back to two at each location. So this will, each of those you'll see are two stalks. Oh yeah. And that's like having one per foot 
if they were spaced evenly, a double row, one per foot. So that spacing is, you know, more than adequate to... And I used to sow beans with corn and let them climb on corn, but then you have a mess. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, that'll work for, it works for some people, but I, uh, I like to compost. The, when I pick an ear of corn, I cut the whole stalk at the base and I strip the corn, clean the cob, the ear off for the house and chop up the husk and all of the stock, everything into the compost right away green and it composts real fast and then I'm not dealing with corn stalks later. Yeah. And uh, some people wonder why I don't have weeds or a lot of weeds and it's because uh, Lynn does a lot of weeding, <laughs> that's for sure. I do too, but we cultivate pretty much to, for weed control. And uh, I have a wheel hoe that I can push with a scuffle blade that can do the paths rapidly. I can just walk down and it slices on the paths. And, and, but I do uh, kind of, I do kind of a lot of cultivating by hand. I mean, a tool like this, I can cultivate down be between two rows. I don't have to bend over. But the key with cultivating is to, uh, is to destroy the weeds kind of just before you see them. If you keep uh, the top surface of the soil loose, uh, weeds can't get a start. Mm -hmm. There's always some hand weeding. But, and uh, this tool is pretty neat. Yeah, Tell us this about is, that. This is... Uh, a little hand cultivator attached to a long handle. And I made this, uh, I think about, I made it when I lived in Minnesota and I've been in Virginia since 93. <laughs> this was a piece of scrap wood from a slab pile, stove wood. And I, it is one drywall screw and one hose clamp. And these prongs have worn down. <laughs> this, this tool has been used for, for decades, literally. I really like it. I, and, I've you know, been using I'm not, the... It's super light. And, yeah. You know, it's, it's just been a... I just walk around with it. But... Uh, yeah, whenever I see you, you're holding that well, thing. Well, maybe I'm getting tippy <laughs> and I need something <laughs> no, to lean on. That could be a, another uh, reason. I've this, been using a stirrup hoe right, in, in the same way, but this seems easier to get close to the plants. Yeah, I kind of know where it is from having used it. So I can, you know, I can just like, these are rutabagas. Okay. And they're floppy and they will size up later in the fall. But, you know, I can, you know, I can cultivate. I mean, it's clean now. I don't need to do this, but I'm just demonstrating. But but also, um, is it also helping when after a, a hard rain to kind of loosen it up so it doesn't get that crust? Well, I think so. If, if the amount of organic matter is high enough and your soil's not too clayey, mm -hmm. it's not a problem. Look at all this purslane. It's, yeah. Purslane is a great weed if you got to have a weed, but it sure can spread. Because you can eat it, right? It's yeah, like a green, it. yeah. edible green. It's a high in omega-3, too, I think. See, now this is what I don't like. This is, you know, crab, yeah. crab grasses. That's something I don't want. There's weeds that I think are, are, are not so threatening and other weeds that I have kind of a... You drop everything to get them, right? Well, <laughs> and that's not the worst crab grass. There's varieties that are so really bad. Yeah, uh, this is a mole. What are you doing for them? Because I, I well, I have a them. mole trap. Yeah. And I gave, I lent it to someone up in Floyd, and as soon as I gave my trap away, <laughs> they show uh, up. The moles showed up, and they went through these carrot beds, which of course need moisture from below to germinate well, and root in, and they can't be all riddled with tunnels. Yeah. But. Uh, she hasn't gotten her mole yet, so I'm going to give her another week, and then I want my <laughs> trap back. So you, were, do you just set it in the garden, and they'll it just has get two, in there? It has two loops. It's called a Nash double choker mole trap, and it's it's like a mouse trap, old-fashioned mouse trap, except for moles. And so it, it kills them when it gets it them. It kills them uh -huh. dead, 
rapidly. It's, I think it's fairly humane. If you got to kill a mole, Nash. that's the way to do it. Nash, N-A-S-H. I'll have to look that it's up. It's got a powerful spring and two loops. And the trip paddle is in between the two loops. So you just put it going across the tunnel, either press it into the ground or cut two slots with a spade and push it down and collapse the tunnel right under the, mm. pad, the trigger. And when they come through the tunnel to reopen it up and they push up on the paddle, the two loops spring up and it gets strangled around the middle. Not a, not a way, nice way to go, but uh, you want to go this way? Or? Yeah, let's walk, walk down towards the tomatoes. This way? Yeah, I, I think we can fit through here. These are, uh, these are more peppers, but these are all hot peppers. And they're over here, so in an attempt to lessen the pollination from my sweet peppers ah, up there. Yes. Uh, I never succeed totally. There are always some surprises, but at and least... And what will happen? You'll end up with a hot sweet pepper? <laughs> uh, you'll have a more hot pepper than you expected. But these are not super hot. They're like Anaheim's. They're, mi oh. they're mild hot. I'm. Yeah. I'm not too crazy about it. Down here, these are cucumbers. I saw one. And they're all pickling cukes. Oh, here's one. And here's one, there. There's oh, yeah. one that got missed. Actually, these got picked in the evening yesterday, so there, there should be some in here. Whoops. And uh, this is the deer fence here. And the deer fence is only two strands of electric. And uh, once or twice a year, here's a remnant here. Once or twice a year, this is from last year. I put tin foil on the lower wire and put peanut butter on the tin foil. And that way my resident deer come wandering down here and they, they, they get a, they get a zap way. right on the nose. And then they know they're not supposed to be here. And it works pretty well. Usually the deer you have are the same deer that keep coming through anyway. So you just uh, teach them a couple times. They are getting times. trained with peanut butter. Uh, I've made uh, three buckets of cucumbers already, uh, pickles already. There's pick cucumbers in here. Here's some. About That's about the right size right there. But they're all in here. I'm about had it with cucumbers, which always <laughs> happens about the end of July. They're about done. Uh, the watermelons over there, the cucumbers here, the winter squash here, and the sweet potatoes over there are all planted at the very edge of the garden so they can run out under the fence uh -huh. and expand because they need more room. These are butternut squash here. Another row of peanuts just above them, and then the tomatoes. And so tomatoes are kind of demanding a little more attention these days? Time well, to yeah, the they, as they're, they're starting to ripen, and as they do, they tend to blight from the bottom up. And I prune off blighted leaves carefully. And what do you mean by carefully? You don't well, want to touch Well, you don't them? want to, whatever touches the blight, you'd rather not, uh, You'd rather not uh, contaminate the upper part of the plant with that because it spreads upward. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see a leaf here. See this one? Yeah. There, yeah. I generally put pr uh, blighted tomato stuff in my burn pile. I, they tell you not to compost it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, I trellis, maybe the other side would be better to see. Okay. It's hard to know. The light might be better. We believe that food and community go hand in hand. Yet family farms are slowly disappearing from this country, taking with them a piece of community. We are here to counteract that trend. Since 1892, the Slusher family has farmed the land along Rush Fork Creek in Floyd County, where Fields Edge Farm operates today. At Fields Edge, we dream of a world where the phrase, local food, means food grown by your friends, your neighbors, and in your own backyard. 
we dream of bringing back the family farm, or at least the family garden, so neighbors and friends can share seed, produce, stories, and food with each other and keep a piece of community alive. We know we aren't the only ones with this dream. Join us for the Fields Ed workshops and have a working farm as your classroom to learn to successfully grow your own produce and develop the skills to take your garden as far as you can dream. I put in T-posts. So right here is a T-post. That's a T-post. Well, that's a channel. They're whatever. They're steel posts. And then I lash on bamboo as high as the, the, the lowest posts. I try and get it up at, you know, four feet or so. By the way, there's probably comfrey under here. See, that's oh, yeah, there's that's the comfrey. dry. That's comfrey. It didn't. The rain didn't. It, we went through a dry spell, but I cover it all up. But and I anyway, can see that it's getting this white. I always thought that was it was actually burning, but that's not. Right? No, that's, that's part of the part of the decomposition. decomposition. It needs to get a good soaking. But uh, I put these T posts in and, and tie on one sturdy bamboo along the top, and then mm -hmm. I use twine. That's, each tomato plant has a twine, and that twine gets loosely tied down at the bottom here. Right here, you can see when it was young, and as the tomato plant grows, I just wind it around the twine, which is the way tomatoes are trellised in hothouse growth. So it's like almost a commercial grower method. Well, yeah, you don't have to tie them. You just keep turning, winding them around. And I do my best to, to pinch off all the suckers until they get close to the bamboo. Once they get close to the top rail, I let them go and let them branch. And then by the end of the season, these tomatoes will be, the whole bottom half will just be a bare trunk. Of course, the tomatoes will be gone. And you want foliage to protect the ripening fruit from too much sun scald. Mm. But uh, once they get to the top, the fruit is all up on the top. And I just interweave the tops and let them drape. And that way they're farther from the ground and the blight and they seem to last longer. Uh, so how long into the season will you end up with tomatoes up here? Up till the freeze? Well, yeah, the blight is usually what limits things. This bed of tomatoes are, are th this bed are all hybrid tomatoes. This is like ultra boy or big boy or better boy or whatever. I don't even keep track anymore. And the other bed down there are heirloom varieties. There's some cherry tomatoes and some big cherries on the end. Those are Campari, I think. They're like golf ball size. That's one of my favorite tomatoes. So uh, when you're when you're doing the um, suckering, how do you do it? Well, if it's young, if it's a tiny sucker, I just pinch it off right at the leaf node where it first appears. If I catch it in time, if I don't, and it starts to grow, I don't want to cut it off there or tear it because that risks rot starting in the main stem. It has to heal over that scar. So as long as you pinch off a, a considerable amount of the tip of what you want to remove, it'll stop growing and it'll just basically become a leaf stem. In other words, here, here's an example. This one got, that got stopped and it's trying to regrow and it could be, it could be pinched off again, but it's close enough to, it's not harming anything there. So that's the sucker. That's where it's been suckered out. twice. I think it was pinched off there once. See right there? Yeah. There. And then it did the same thing here. So Basically, the idea is to induce the plant to grow upward instead of sp spread out. Because the higher it grows, the less the blight seems to be a problem. Uh, and so then you're coming out here every day and picking the ripe ones? Yeah, I'm about ready to start. Maybe even I've got a counter full in the house. And you know, the first fruits of the season are always the worst in terms of quality. I think they might have some blossom end rot and you know, they're not, they're not always the best, but once they, later in the season, I think they do better. These are turnips for the fall and they just came up, let's see, I can just thin these and 
cultivate that. This is a double row here. You can see, but you know, I can just thin. They don't need to be anywhere near this thick, but turnip seed is cheap, and so I just, you know, over sowed. And I just make a, a, a furrow with a wheel hoe, sprinkle the seed in standing up, and just rake it over. So this is, this will be two rows of turnips. The, these onions I don't want. They're the remnants of multiplier onions that I cut off already. Winter onions, the ones that top setting onions, walking onions, or whatever they call them. The, this bed was uh, onions. And I want this bed for fall broccoli. And I'll take finished compost from that middle bin and wheelbarrow it down here and rework this bed. Cauliflower is going to go up there in my squash bed that I'm tearing out now. That's fertile enough. I think I'll just leave it as is. And have you started those, uh, those plants? When did you start the seeds? I started those, uh, I'll show them to you, probably about three weeks to a month ago. Okay. Uh, this is fennel. More celery act. Don't ask me why I have so much. <laughs> this is all coming out. This is a... Uh, this here is, was a parsnip that was left from last year to save for seed. Parsnips and carrots, and they're all biennials. They, they grow a, a root, and then the second year they send up their flower and seed producing apparatus. So these two beds will be fall stuff. And I gotta get that fennel out of here. But once again, the roots from my shade trees have rob these beds, certainly at this end. So that's why I've planted flowers and stuff. Uh-huh. Uh, so I had a question oh, uh, about the, the um, blossom end rot. Um, that's basically caused by, I think, two things, a, cal a shortage of calcium. But I think, I personally think more important is a uh, irregularity in water, mm -hmm. watering, and which is one reason why mulching tomatoes is so beneficial. Mm. If I have enough grass clippings to mulch my garden, uh, tomatoes are the first thing I mulch, always, mm -hmm. because it evens out the moisture and that has something to do with the uptake of calcium. It's not necessarily, there are foliar sprays. You can mix up lime or whatever, you can spray it on the tomatoes, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things to help. But blossom end rot usually is just at the beginning, at the first tomatoes that come in. Mm -hmm. But once the plant roots down deeper, I think it's better. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question. The other night I discovered uh, like seven tomato hornworms and oh, they yeah. had decimated like the yeah, top of the Yeah, you gotta look, always keep your eye out. I've only picked off three and what I really enjoy doing is throwing them in the pond and watching the fish eat them. <laughs> yeah, I like feeding <laughs> them to the chickens. That's very gratifying. They're a delicacy for chickens. Oh, I bet, I yeah. bet. Uh, BT works well for oh. that. And you'd only need a very light overspray on the tomatoes. But if you keep your eyes out, you'll see where they've been chewing and you'll see their telltale defecations that look like little mm -hmm. space, little capsules of green, little green barrels. Yeah, yeah. but uh, they're so camouflaged, yeah, oh, yes. you can they, miss them. You can look at them and then go right back and then to the same spot and not see them the second time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this bed was, this is my last zucchini here. I sow zucchini each time the plant gets about this big here, about the size of a dinner plate, I sow the next batch, and that way I have a, a continuous supply of, off of young plants, because the flavor of them is always better off a new plant than one that's full of bugs. Yeah. And so I do a succession sowing. This bed, though, was my spring broccoli. This was all broccoli. So I retilled, got all the roots out, and redid this, cut all these onions down. I just left them there to hold the shoulder of the bed. Mm -hmm. There's a slope here, so I try and keep the beds raised. Uh, the more, the wetter it's gonna be, the more you wanna have your beds raised. Yeah. And back to the trellis again. This trellis framework here, which is the bamboo, 
and the T-post. When the tomatoes are done, I will strip the tomatoes off and kind of clean up the bed. It's mulch. It's clean, free of weeds. I'll just kind of work it over with a fork, and that's where I plant peas next year. And you put that chicken wire on that. Right. I have a uh, two-inch chicken wire, five feet, that I apply to that, unroll it, and that the peas anchor to that. So, so when you're you're putting this in, you're you're putting it in, but you're using it for two seasons here. I'm or... using it for the tomatoes, and then through June for the peas. Mm -hmm. And then once the pea, I, once the peas are done, I pull them off, shred them up, rip them off, glean out any peas for, that have dried that I miss for pea seed for the next year. I grow uh, sugar snap tall peas, and then I. Um, roll up the chicken wire and put it back in the shed and I tear, I pull the posts out. So after the peas in, it comes come, out in this mid, coming spring, it comes this will come out? In mid-June. Okay. And then next, after the peas, that bed will be carrots. That'll be carrots. Just like the one over where there. we started. Yeah. So you have really over these years and with your notebook and your note taking and your practice really developed a schedule for crop rotation. It's a rotation that works for me because, mm -hmm. well, you know, when I look at people's garden plans, they always have a map and I, and I always say to myself, well, I don't want that much of that or that's not enough, you know, broccoli or whatever. I mean, everyone's needs are different mm -hmm. and so everyone's uh, garden will be different. Mm -hmm. But a rotation is basically about you know, not repeating the same family crops for mm -hmm. pests. Mm -hmm. And I guess I violate that rule because I try and grow squashes and on the perimeter of the garden, whether it's a cucumber or a winter squash or a watermelon, mm -hmm. they have common pests and they usually end up in the same right. edge of the garden. So I guess as home gardeners, we, we have limitations to being able to rotate as I ideally as we right. could. Yeah, but this works with the tomatoes. It's not too much labor to put the tea posts in. They're about six or seven feet apart, and I put four tomato plants in there. I've experimented with different spacing. What's the one you've landed on? Well, there's. I think those are seven feet apart, and there's four tomato plants in there. So your your each plant is maybe two feet apart. That's Something one, like two, that. three, four. It's uh, a little less than two feet. A little less feet. than two feet. Yeah, probably 20, 22 inches or something. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me see. Over there at the bottom is sweet potatoes. And uh, they will run way out, too. Uh, they're, uh, Are you, did you plant them in a hill? Yes. Mm -hmm. That is a very... Sweet potatoes are far easier to dig if they're in a real steep hill. I hill up the soil just as tall as I can. You can see how oh, yeah. the shape of this. Mm -hmm. And you know, they're in there. There's already sweet potatoes forming, but that's a hill. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I try and keep them under control <laughs> so I can walk through that path. These yeah, tomatoes are not there. looking so good. Those are Mr. Stripey and all the rain. I see I got one there falling down. But you can see the blight on those farming too. I haven't pruned them or kept them up properly. I feel, I feel ill prepared here today. I think you look pretty prepared, Frank. Where? I just, <laughs> this, I saw one that, this one. That, oh. So let's see how you do that. Cause well, that was I try and interweave the tops. So like if, in other words, if they're coming from two sides, you know, the idea is that they, they'll end up being a long tunnel of, of foliage that's hanging on this top rail. And since it is round, the bamboo, it, it doesn't, I used to use sticks, but they have sharp edges and the bamboo actually is longer and works better. And, so the sticks would cut them. Exactly. So you're just but, flipping them over. Yeah, I'm just trying to weave them so they 
there's dead. minimal tying. Once they get to that height, I don't, I'm, I'm done anchoring pretty much. But anyway, and this is the other bed of carrots, and you can see where the moles are. Uh, by the way, when I sow peas on this fence the next year, I, it grow, the peas are sown right down the middle, and on the lower side of the bed, I always put in beets. Uh -huh. And these are the remnants of those. I'm done with beets. I've canned and canned and given away beets. These will come out, these few that are left. Uh, on the far side, over here, where this row of carrots is, I sow lettuce in the spring. Same time I put the peas in, and that way the lettuce is in the shade of the peas. Mm. And lettuce like cool, shadier. And the soil's good enough for lettuce too so the and they and it comes the, the lettuce comes out about the same time as the peas also because they're they don't like the heat so then i have an open bed i can retill it just quickly and just and re-sow the carrots uh this is we're almost done here <laughs> another <laughs> fifth row of peanuts i like peanuts I think they're great. A great food. They're undergrown, I think, in my opinion. Yeah. These are Roma beans here. You can see them. They're flat the dry bean? Italian. Or a green bean? Green beans. Okay. Yeah, Roma Italian mm. beans. This is another row of <clears throat> potatoes. These are, this is okra, and for some reason, could be shade, could be soil, whatever. They really have not done well this year. See, there's one there. They like it really hot, don't they? They do, and we had cold, wet, these things. And this is the worst oak. Normally, this enti entire bed should be taller than this one by now. But they're coming along. This was my earliest zucchini here, which I'm tearing out. I'll tear the rest of that out and chop it into the compost. And I'll put cauliflower in here. So with composting a plant that's gotten the bugs... I kill them as they crawl out if I can. You see them? And I bury them and, yeah, I and mean, I was surprised. And the compost There's, will kill them? Pardon? The it does somewhat. The they tend to crawl out. I mean, it's squash bugs mostly. They mm -hmm. look like stink bugs, kind yeah. of. Those, and uh, I try to kill as many as possible. This is more beets here on these two beds. I just had grew extra. This is pitiful looking collards, but I won't eat that until late in the year. I, that's, I don't know why I stuck it in there. I know I didn't keep up with the bugs, but they'll recover and by, by fall. See, there's, I don't know if that's one, that cabbage worm, you know, they didn't yes. get. And this is, uh, these are parsnips. <clears throat> these are parsnips. Yeah. Looks like a carrot. Yeah. Does it taste like a carrot? You know what parsnips are. I don't know. That really? I, Carl's allergic. My husband's allergic to parsnips, so oh. I haven't had them. And well, I didn't grow up with parsnips. Parsnips are great in soup. They mm -hmm. can stay in the ground through the harshest winter. Oh, they can okay. freeze. And then they get sweeter in the spring. They smell. They're, they're... They don't smell like a carrot. Oh, yeah. They're different. They're different. They're in soups and stews. They're great as a roasted vegetable, I think. Mm. Oh. So, that's it. That's the garden. That's, all. that's, that's all. the workshop that's over have. there. <laughs> and there's some uh, rosemary and some tarragon and some butterfly weed and wood pile. And it's, it's the... Uh, well, there is an, a lot to, to talk about and learn from here. Frank, we just touched oh, the these, tip of the iceberg. These are, uh, these are my starts. Okay, so these have only been in here for a couple weeks, three weeks? I, these were seeded the 1st of July. Okay, that's pretty fast. This flat is cauliflowers here, and I love cauliflower. These are an open pollinated sprouting broccoli that's, you know, 
it was old seed and I, I have, it's, it's like, uh, it has another name. It's n not real heading. It's for cutting Roughly over. Rob? It's like that, but no, it forms heads, but more open and mm -hmm. taller. Th this is a hybrid broccoli here. There's a, should be 24 of those. And these are more cabbage, a blue green cabbage. So that's more than enough for three beds here. I'll go through and re-fork those squash beds. They're pretty good, but the, but the onion beds down there, will, I'll put more compost in. I've got compost that's ready. So you can really get twice as much out of your garden if you are prepared to do a fall planting. Well, I, my aim is to eat out of the garden for as much of the year as I can. Yeah. So I, I do that. And, and another example is when I dig another rotation, when I dig those two beds of potatoes, and I used to grow more potatoes, but you can only eat so much. Yeah. And uh, with sweet potatoes and winter squash, you know, I, and other vegetables to roast, uh, the two beds of potatoes is plenty. When I dig those potatoes, those two beds, in the middle of August, which is only three more weeks, uh, I'll rework those beds add more compost again, and then I will sow one in kale and one in spinach in the early middle September. And that's actually plenty of time. And then that kale and spinach, which are the hardiest of all vegetables that I grow, can easily go through the winter. Mm -hmm. And some people say that's because I'm down here in Woolwine, but I lived in Meadows of Dan for six or seven years, and I overwintered spinach up there. Mm -hmm. And I, from my experience, the key is to sow it at the right time and to have a plant that's big enough, but not too big. And that's the strongest kind of plant to live through the winter. And what I do is I sow a double row down the middle of the beds, the spinach and kale, and just like the turnips or the rutabagas back there, or the beans are all in double rows, about 14 inches apart. And then when they get up to a good size, I run the wheel hoe down the middle with the furrower, and it almost buries them with soil, mm. the crown of the plant. The plants are only six or so inches high. And then I fill that channel in the middle with compost finished compost, which it both feeds and insulates, and it, it kind of half covers the plant. And then on the outsides of the bed, the shoulders of the bed, I sprinkle fresh sawdust out of a bucket to insulate the outside of the bed. And they have, they're insulated in the middle with compost, and they'll, they'll go right through the harshest winters. Wow. And that way, it's the, it's not the leaves that can't freeze, it's the root and the root crown. You want a young plant, but you don't want it so young that frost would heave it out of the ground and disconnect its roots. So that's, uh, and so I have spinach that's huge at the end of February. Because mm -hmm. it went, it's, it takes off as soon as the days get long, it explodes. And I have all the spinach and kale I could ever want. And, uh, Which is really it, nice in that time of year to have something yeah. fresh from well, the Lynn garden. Lynn posted a picture of me chainsawing my kale. Yeah. Uh, back, that's where those uh, peanuts are over there. That was the kale. I didn't realize that was kale you were that chainsawing. That was kale, and it was woody. I didn't even thin it. It was a double row, and I wanted to just get it out of there. It was like, it had been in the ground for like, you know, months and months. Mm -hmm. That's gone from September until May. And then did you leave the roots in there? I, I chainsawed the tops off with a little chainsaw. I forked it into the compost pile. That's the greener top part. The woodier stubs that were about five or six inches, I set my push mower at its highest height and I ran it down the bed and shredded the stubs down further. And that chopped the stubs up put that in the compost pile, and then I ran the tiller through deeply, and ripped, which ripped all of the roots and their stubs out, and then I raked those out, 
and oh. threw those in the burn pile. Why not just pull them? You can, but it's a lot of work. The oh, tiller okay. just, you were going to till, uh, loosen the soil anyway. It had been, and keep in mind there's all that compost on the top from the tail end spinach, so that got incorporated in the ground. There's a hard clay pan underneath all of this. This looks like a nice bottom, but if you dig down very far, like eight inches, it's, it's red clay. It's pretty, uh, pretty inhospitable subsoil. So the deeper the topsoil is, the better. So, you know, people have different theories about tillage and what's uh, over tilling and what's not. You don't want to destroy the soil structure, but you want to deepen the active part of the soil. Mm-hmm. So, uh, wow. yeah, well, that's Very it. Very nice. Thank you so much well, for having welcome. us, giving us such a good tour and um, teaching yeah. us along the way. Yeah. Definitely uh, learned a lot from you over the years. Well, it's, uh, it's what I like to do, so uh, I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what retirement is about, doing what you like to do, I think. So speaking of that, uh, is this a, a big part of your day? How much time are you out here? I would say an hour or two a day at the most. Okay. But if it's something, you know, I do it in the mornings when it's cool and when it's hot. Hey, I'm inside. I've already canned a ridiculous amount of beets and I haven't started tomatoes yet although the counter is filling up in the kitchen so I've canned applesauce from what's dropped off the trees I've canned a lot of strawberries mm -hmm. and uh, probably a dozen quarts of beans so far and there's still beans all over the place I think those romas a lot of those I'm gonna let go as dry beans because it's more than I can eat. And with COVID, I'm not seeing people and giving away what I normally would give away. Mm -hmm. And I'm encouraging people, this is an, this is an ad, a plug, <laughs> come and visit and get veggies. <laughs> so uh, I like visitors and That's you know, tempting. we're outside and a few at a time, I think is a safe way to socialize. Yes, so. absolutely. And in the garden is one of the best places to socialize. I'm watching a hummingbird flying around your tomatoes out there. Yeah. Uh, um, and are you providing most of the food for yourself and Lynn? I'm buying, uh, I buy orange juice and bananas and half and half and coffee and I buy sugar because I use some of that in some of my canning and cooking and you know, yeah, I buy food. But I don't you ever, you'll up. never see me in the produce section, <laughs> no. that, except for bananas. Yeah. I like my bananas. I make them, I collect a large amounts of black walnuts and I dehull them, dry them and store them and then have a good cracker and have kind of perfected my technique of tempering them so that they're easier to crack. There's a moisture treatment thing you can do to make cr cracking them easier but make the nut meats more flexible so when you crack them they don't shatter and they're easier to get bigger pieces out. So I eat a lot of bl black walnuts and my peanuts mixed together. So I buy raisins mm -hmm. because raisins are about 10 percent or 15 percent of my nut mix, but I eat a lot of peanuts and black walnuts. That's where you're getting your protein. Well, no, I eat meat too. Oh. I mean, I'm, I eat eggs and mm -hmm. cheese and yeah, I buy other that stuff, sort of stuff too. Oh yeah, yeah, I don't have animals here. See, this is not that cold. This is water from one of the gravity springs here that I can use to water the garden. The overflow goes out these hoses or into the pond and then from the pond back to the creek. But this is a 300 gallon Rubbermaid stock tank that's two feet deep and there's a nice solar heater, big coil of black poly out in the sun that heats this during the day in the summer and if it's not warm enough or it's a cloudy day or if it's not summer I just fill up this little beer keg here with wood and light it off and this is my uh, hot tub here and it's great. I love it. It's been here about as long as the pond I think about 12 or 13 years. 
So and when we I was were... worried. I was worried it would degrade, but it seems to be hanging in there pretty Looks good. It's pretty new. Yeah. So when I was out talking with Frank and preparing for today's episode, I realized that he has a wealth of knowledge to share that's aside from gardening. And, and this is one that he is getting all of his water from springs up, up the hill and piped it down and done it all himself with a pond that he dug himself. And the way that this hot tub works and all of the ways that you're reusing the water and all of that is is fascinating. And um, I'd love to come back out and okay. do a show that's just great. about that. Yeah, just even watering. I don't spray overhead. I just irrigate with water flowing down. I can demonstrate how I laid out these beds. They're pretty much on the contour, but with the grade going downhill so that I can flood any of the paths and the water then goes and soaks into the bed right adjacent. So that's my watering system. There's hoses around that are off the drain from this tub. So Yeah, so let's let's yeah, uh, that'll be let's another do day. A deeper dive into that next time. That would be and, great. And the garden is always producing different stuff yeah. at a different time. So always something you, to talk about. Y'all come back, as we'll, they say. We'll be back. Thank you so much, Frank. Well, you're welcome. <laughs>